Thank you for the introduction. Um, today we will talk about HiFrames, which is a package, uh, hopefully a future package providing high performance distributed data frames in Julia. The motivation for our work is that data analytics is the greatest value driver in technology today. And by 2020, it's estimated that we will have 50 billion smart devices generating massive amounts of data. For example, a self-driving car generates four terabytes of data per day. So we need to process and analyze all of this data, and we need to democratize high-performance computing resources for data scientists to be able to analyze this data. However, there is a large uh, productivity performance gap in this area. Data scientists like scripting languages, which are very productive, but they are serial and slow. Julia, Julia is actually helping to change this, and our effort is one of the potential efforts in Julia. There are some big data frameworks, such as Hadoop and Spark, but they are uh, very slow as well, because they are essentially high overhead runtime libraries, and they are not based on parallel computing fundamentals. If you are interested in the CS aspect and fundamental issues with current frameworks, we have a paper uh, that I've cited here. You can take a look. It has a lot of interesting uh, details. So high performance data analytics requires low level programming, which is not practical for interactive workflows of data scientists and it's beyond their expertise. If I have 10 minutes to try out an idea, I can't go off, spend ten, uh, two months write low-level parallel code. So our goal is to provide producti productivity and performance simultaneously in this area, which is exactly in line with Julia's goals. Here's a quick overview of high frames before getting into details. High frames provides high performance data frames. Data frames are essentially tables that can have various number of columns. Each column can have different type than other columns. That's how they're different than matrices. And uh, very basic data analytics uh, constructs that everyone needs. Our goal is to provide intuitive data frame syntax, meaning the best possible, the easiest data frame syntax, even better than Julia's data frames.jl, the standard data frames package of Julia, which is already great. We want our data frames to blend in other code naturally without function barriers or complicated tricks. And we want our data frames to be fast, um, which is the basic requirement. We also want to scale to large scale clusters and cloud environments automatically without significant effort from the programmer. So these are our four goals. Let's look at an example. On the left, we have a basic data frame called DF. Column A, floating point values. Column B, integer values. We have three rows with these values. So to process this, first we want to filter the, uh, this data frame based on values of A. We want the rows that have value A greater than four, essentially these two rows out of three. So we use this filtering syntax. As you might notice, this expression is not compilable in Julia. It's not valid to compare a symbol and a floating point value. But here, we use this symbol to refer to columns. In our essentially domain-specific language, this expression has a meaning. So we want to provide this. And Julia's macro system helps us enable this. In other languages, it's not possible, usually. So we take this um, DF1 data frame with just these two rows, and we want to do mean normalization. We want to take the values of B, column B, and divide them by the mean of all the values. So very simple syntax to do all of this. Filter, then mean normalize. Now imagine the same data, frames, data frame has having billions of rows, several billions of rows, and we want to run this on thousands of cluster or cloud nodes. We want the same syntax to work without any change automatically on this large scale system. 
This is the goal that we actually achieve in this project. So what is the existing solution in this big data area? In big data analytics, Apache Spark is the dominant framework, which is essentially a master-slave library of some operations, map element-wise operations, reduce reduction of values such as uh, sum, and so on. For doing table operations, you need to use Spark SQL, right? SQL code embedding some uh, syntax then write map reduce high level code in Python or Scala. One might say Spark does have data frames. Why wouldn't you use that? Yes, it does, but because it's a library, it's very limited. For example, you can't write expressions in your aggregates. You will end up writing SQL code anyway. So see, write, what's wrong with writing SQL code? It's hard to use because we have a two language problem that essentially Julia is trying to solve as well for uh, scripting versus C. Here we have SQL versus other language. Um, and also, Spark SQL is slow because it's built on top of Spark, which is a hard-coded map-reduced library. And we will see what happens in a couple of minutes. Our solution is to use end-to-end -end compilation. We take the whole analytics program, which includes data frames, and compile and parallelize on a cluster automatically. Here is a qu quick overview of the system, how it's implemented before getting into the details. High frames is essentially an embedded domain-specific language, or EDSL, some syntax that's embedded inside Julia. And we use Julia's met metaprogramming and extendability features to implement high frames. The, our approach is to use compiler optimization and parallelization. Essentially, Julia code plus our high frames should be compiled to efficient parallel code automatically. We have a prototype system in Julia currently. It's inside the HPAD package. We want to extract it to, a, to its own package later. And we, uh, we plan to build another prototype in Python for comparison or research purposes. So all of our systems are available online, uh, Perl Accelerator, HPAT, and everything else. On the Python side, we are building on top of the Namba JIT compiler. For this work, we have a paper as well, which is on archive online right now, if you are interested in more details of this high frame system and this new approach of doing data frames. So to describe high frames, let's look at this software stack. High frames is built on top of HPAT that I will describe in a minute, which is in turn built on top of Parallel Accelerator. These, uh, these are essentially three compiler layers that we will talk about in a minute. So what is Parallel Accelerator? Parallel Accelerator takes data parallel Julia functions and accelerates and parallelizes them automatically for shared memory machines. So you annotate your code with this at ACC decorator, and um, the system generates uh, efficient multi-threaded code right now, C++, OpenMP, and we are planning on native path as well. We are working on native path as well. Um, and it's all done automatically. So in several benchmarks, we see 10 to 100 x speed up. If you haven't used Parallel Accelerator already, I encourage you to give that a try. It's a great package. If you are interested in knowing the details of how this system works, we have a paper as well, which is published in this uh, computer science conference called ECOOL. You can take a look. Sorry. So how does Parallel Accelerator work, and how do we use it? So let's assume we have a data parallel array expression here and depict it here. Here we do element-wise multiplication of arrays A and B, and we do element-wise addition with array C. Parallel accelerator takes this code and recognizes the parallelism inside this code because of its semantics. So it generates things we call par for, data parallel for loops for all of these operations. Then it fuses these loops to get rid of these intermediate values and decrease the memory accesses. Very important for cache performance and uh, the overall performance of your function. And then uh, generates the output code in OpenMP 
to be used. We take these par fours as our starting point to build other systems, HPAT first and then high frames. So these data parallel for loops are essential compiler constructs for us. So with that, let's um, talk about HPAT. HPAT stands for High Performance Analytics Toolkit which essentially compiles a subset of high-level Julia data parallel operations, arrays, and so on, to run on clusters automatically. And we have um, performance comparisons 20 to 2,000 times faster than Apache Spark, the dominant framework these days. So this is an example function that HPAD compiles. I have this logistic regression function which is decorated with at ACC HPAT, meaning that it should be compiled with HPAT. This function has a whole lot of array and vector, uh, uh, matrix and vector operations in it that HPAT understands. HPAT takes this and automatically parallelizes it for uh, clusters. So here is example of HPAT generated MPI C++ code. MPI stands for message passing interface, mm -hmm. which is the low-level low system for writing parallel codes on clusters. So HPAT generates this, all of this boilerplate code that you need to write in C, initializations, allocations, and so on. Mm -hmm. To load the data, you need to do parallel I.O., which is quite complicated, but HPAT automates this as well, because you need to load the data uh, simultaneously in cluster nodes. Then, obviously, generates the computation, optimized version of the computation input to HPAT, and also it has to generate communication across nodes in your cluster. In this case, we have MPI R reduce, which is very common in machine learning to aggregate all of the weight updates. So this is bare metal MPI C++ code with negligible overheads. The alternative systems in this area, such as Spark, are high overhead runtimes that essentially interpret code. But HPAT compiles to native low-level code. We plan to uh, use LLVM for code generation, get through native path of Julia, uh, some practical issues there. And on the Python side, we use LLVM anyways. So a bit about how HPAT does this. HPAT uses domain-specific parallelization for data analytics. What it means is that in data analytics, we know the parallel patterns of computations. The dominant pattern is map-reduced uh, uh, paradigm, meaning that the operations are either element-wise, highly data parallel, or they are reduction in their semantics. There are some exceptions as well, but these are the dominant operations. Given this knowledge, it's much easier to compile and analyze the code. So to go from high-level code to low-level implementation, first, HPAT extracts parallelism by parallel accelerator. As we talked about, it uses parallel accelerator to get these par-4 constructs, these loops out of the program. Then it uses high-level semantics of the program for analysis. And um, there is this approach called data flow framework in compilers that you use to write compiler algorithm that HPAD uses to find distribution of data and computation across the cluster. It has to make a lot of decisions for that. Um, there is a lot of detail into this. We just published the paper at uh, ICS, a super, a super computing conference. If you are interested in more details of HPAT, uh, please go ahead and look at this paper. A quick example of how parallelization should work in data analytics and how HPAT does this automatically. On the left side, I have this matrix of samples. Each column has several feature, three features that I want to do machine learning on, and I have six samples. I have some labels for those samples as well. This is a small example, but th there could be billions of these samples in my data set. And I have some weights that I want to train. To parallelize this, in this case, on three processors, I, na I need to divide my samples in blocks, simple division of the data across the processors. This is called, in parallel computing, 1D block distribution, the very basic distribution you can have. 
the labels should be distributed in the same way as well, 1D block. But these weights need to be replicated. They're essentially on the reduced side. And uh, HPAD can make this decision deciding between replicated distribution of data and block distribution of data automatically based on the semantics of your high-level Julia code. So what is the limitation of this compiler approach that we are talking about? What, uh, what, what are the programs that wouldn't work? So the input to HPAD should be statically compilable. This is the very basic limitation of this approach. Meaning that if you write dynamic code saying, if this variable A is an array, do something, otherwise do something else, meaning that this variable could have different types, then this compiler can't analyze this program and parallelize it for you. However, this is quite rare in analytics. I've never seen any case where uh, one uses dynamic code like this for data analytics. And Julia community is really good at writing um, type stable code. I think it's called here. So this is not an issue. So how do we build our data frames on top of this HPAT system? The, the high level idea is to convert these data frames. Data frames are weird objects. It's really hard to handle them in uh, both a library and a compiler. So we convert them to arrays. Each column just becomes an array. We are essentially a column store, which is the best way of storing tables if you talk to the database community. So we convert these data frames to arrays, but keep the metadata of these tables in the metadata section of the intermediate representation IR of the program in the compiler. We also add new IR nodes for these uh, relational operations, filter, join, aggregate, and so on in the compiler. And we add extensions to the compiler stages to handle these IR nodes. This is all there is in the high level idea and the rest is just details of how things should work in a compiler system. So what are the high level operations and how are they implemented in HPAT? The very basic operation you want from a data frame is projection. I want to take column ID and do something with it, run array operations or whatever. This is very easy here because column, each column is an array anyways. We can just return it. For filtering, we have this syntax, as I talked about. This is not normal Julia syntax, but we can handle it, replace these with um, a filter operation and uh, arrays in the compiler. For join, where we take two data frames, join them based on some join criteria, we added this syntax where you can express your join criteria and uh, references to the keys for joining the two data frames. Again, this is not a very usual Julia syntax, but it makes sense in our domain and we handle it through the macro system. For aggregation, uh, where we want to aggregate all the values of each key, we have this syntax to express the data frame, the key, and the aggregation expression that you would normally write in SQL. Here, we want for each values of ID, the mean of Y values assigned to output called YM in the output table. So we can express a lot of things in the syntax. The reason we designed uh, the syntax this way was to enable users to write everything in the syntax and not go to SQL or alternative measures. If the code is simpler, it's easier for the compiler to handle it as well. So it's a win-win situation. Other data frames that we have looked at, which are essentially libraries, cannot do this. And usually, you would have to do something complex or revert to uh, SQL. A quick example of how this construct go through the compiler and parallel code for cluster is generated in the back end. So I have an aggregate operation here on this sale items data frame. And the key is just customer keys. And I want to uh, see how many of the items have ID equals one. Sum on Boolean means just counting. And the output name should be ID one. 
given this aggregate, simple aggregate operation, in the macro pass, we convert everything to regular arrays. Each column becomes just a regular array. And this, so these are, the, uh, these are the regular arrays that we generated. For the expression, we have to make the expression uh, an array expression as well, keep it in another array. We have a trick to, keep, to find out the type of the output column. Everything should be typed. If you want performance, obviously, everything should be typed. Uh, so we run some this aggregation function on the output expression, get the type of it. We essentially use this trick to use the Julia's type inference system to get this type out, but this function will be optimized out at some point anyways. We have this aggregate function here which outputs some columns in terms of normal arrays, takes the key uh, column, and takes this expression result plus the aggregation operator, all the information it needs to do the aggregation. And for the output, we assign the type to make sure everything is typed. So essentially, this funny syntax becomes regular array code, and everything is typed. We then pass, pass this to Julia's compiler, and it generates some really ugly IR that I can't even show you in any way. I wish it was simpler. <laughs> 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 so to make, make it easier to work with this ugly IR, we run this domain pass that um, takes the generated code and creates these expressions. Here, since in Julia you can create your own expression, we create aggregate expression with some inputs for uh, our table aggregation. However, all the stages of the compiler from this point on need to understand this aggregate expression. In compilers, you have liveness analysis, dependence analysis, and so on. Then, eventually, in the back end, you have to replace this expression with parallel implementation. For aggregation, obviously, you have to hash partition the data, typical algorithm, where all the values of, let's say, key one should be on the same processor to enable you to do aggregation. This essentially requires shuffling the data across your cluster, and MPI has already uh, an operator called all to all for it. And we can do communication through MPI. A quick performance evaluation of C where we stand without doing extensive optimizations in our system. So we, uh, we evaluate filter, just single, single operation, join and aggregate. Y axis is execution time, it's logarithmic scale. We use a four node uh, cluster, very small cluster that a lot of people could have access to. And we compare Python, the pandas package, Julia data frames package, Spark SQL, and our high frame system. So Python and Julia run sequentially, obviously, so they just use one core, but, the, but Spark and high frames use all the 144 cores in the cluster. So he, here are the results, Python, Julia, Spark SQL, and high frames. The high frames is faster than all of them by, by a significant margin, it's 3.6 to 70 times faster than Spark SQL, just because Spark SQL is built on top of Spark and it's limited to the high overhead runtime system of Spark. So one might say you showed me a single operation, but relational operations can be optimized as well. How do you do uh, relational optimizations in, uh, well known in the database literature? For example, if I'm joining two tables, potentially large tables, and filtering the output, if I could filter the inputs first, based on dependencies if it's possible, then do the join, join would be faster, because the input sizes to join would be um, smaller. This is a very basic op uh, optimization called pushing filters down in the query tree. It's SQL terminology queries. So the challenge of high frames is to do this sort of relational optimization in a general IR that, that, that can have computation inside it as well. There are a lot of dependencies potentially. 
our approach is to create this query tree, ignore computations, so relationship between filter, join, aggregate, optimize, try to optimize them, but before actually doing those transformations, uh, check the dependencies to make sure they are valid. Essentially a greedy approach for optimization. We also note that a lot of optimizations that SQL systems do are essentially free here. Our Judea compiler does constant folding anyways, or our system does fusion anyways. We don't need to re-implement it for high frames. A quick example of how this transformation works, uh, we have this query tree where two tables are being joined, T1 and T2, and the output is filtered. So the top is the output of the operation. We want to push the filter down to, let's say in this case we can do it on table two. And so filter table two before joining. To do that in our context, we have this join expression in the IR and later filter expression. After checking liveness and dependencies of uh, all the variables in the program, we have to swap this. Um, operations. So how, how, how do we do when there are these optimization opportunities? I have this TPCX big bench benchmark. TPC is a transaction processor council, uh, a lot of standard um, query processing benchmarks. We run this on a Cori machine right here at Berkeley Lab. Uh, Y-axis execution time, X-axis, we go all the way to 64 nodes. And for just the query portion of this program, which includes some relational optimizations, we are, we are five times faster than Spark SQL, which is significant for this benchmark. Now let's get into some fun operations <laughs> done with basic relational things that we need to handle. There are some uh, important analytics operations that don't fit MapReduce. The communication pattern across processors is just, it's not just reduction of values. So for example, moving averages. When you want to, you have an array, for each location you want the average of uh, neighboring locations as well in the output array. In this, if you divide your array in blocks across processors, uh, uh, along the edges you have to do some exchanges between processors to do the uh, moving average for that edge, edge point. So this doesn't fit the map reduced communication pattern and Spark can't handle it well. Another great example is cumulative sum, which for each location you want the sum of all the previous locations. It's a very challenging computation to do in parallel. This is called prefix scan, and MPI already has a primitive for it. Um, this is an example algorithm to do this. For example, for this point, nine is the sum of all the previous values. And there is some sort of multi-step three communication pattern uh, to do this. If you evaluate the performance of this, uh, these operations, cumulative sum, simple moving average, and weighted moving average, for Python, Julia, Spark, and high frames on the, our own cluster, execution time, again, logarithmic scale, we see that there is a huge performance difference of high frames and Spark SQL. Something that takes uh, just over one second in Julia takes two, over 200 seconds in Spark SQL. The reason is that Spark SQL can't handle it. It goes crazy. It collects all the data on a single processor, doesn't fit because it uses a lot of memory, spills to disk, a lot of things go wrong until it can complete the computation in this runtime. But uh, high frames doesn't have this issue, can handle this operation. So for a, something called weighted moving average, we have 20,000 X speed up just because um, Spark SQL cannot handle it and does crazy things. So how can Julia be better to support our systems, which are different than normal Julia packages? Our systems are essentially compilers. So to enable things like high frames, obviously we need to improve package compilation time. For our systems, package compilati compilation time is significant and uh, I can't tell a user, hey, my package is super fast, but you have to wait one minute every time <laughs> you run your Julia. Uh, it slows down development as well. If I'm changing something in my package, I have to wait one minute to see what happens. 
Um, the other issue is defining the IR because for compiler algorithms, you have to know the input precisely to write correct algorithms. Otherwise, it gets uh, really difficult. Another issue is having control over Julia's compiler. I want to potentially turn off some of the optimizations, selectively run them again, and so on. The other issue is robustness. If I'm exposing an API and I want to handle something myself without Julia Optimizer doing crazy things with it, I want at no inline to work, but it sometimes doesn't work. I can't really reproduce it to even file issues easily. Another issue is the debugger for our source of code, which are not numerical codes. The debugger just crashes for our system, Gallium, and uh, there's no way to use it. It's really hard to develop software without a debugger, as everyone in this room knows. Um, with that, I would like to conclude. Quick summary, big data analytics requires high performance data frames, essential constructs for data analytics. The current solution is Spark SQL, which is both hard to use and slow. We built a system called High Frames that is both easy to use and fast. It's essentially a compiled, embedded domain-specific language on top of our HBAS system. It runs on cluster on cloud automatically. And for future work, we need to find a way of developing this research idea into um, a, pro a product, production software for the community to use. With that, uh, here are some references, some of our working papers. and. I would be happy to take questions.